Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to our talk, Kubernetes from scratch for neuroscientific research. So a little bit about the agenda. So we'll first tell you a bit about us and the target audience for this talk, and then how did our interest in Kubernetes start? And then a bit about prototyping Kubernetes and our organization's infrastructure overview, and then um, how it is to run a Kubernetes cluster and do maintenance, and then the, the use cases that we have within the organization, and the process of migrating to Kubernetes and how it is from a Kubernetes user's point of view. So, about us. My name is Carolina Lindquist, and I work as an SRE at EPFL in the Blue Brain project. And uh, I'm in the team for neuroinformatic software engineering. And my team is developing um, a storage application for neuroscientific data. And hello, everyone. My name is Daniel Fernandez. I'm also an SRE. I've been in the uh, Blue Brain project for the last three years as an SRE as well. And I'm in the uh, core services team. And we can think of us as a small IT department for the organization. We take care of different IT services for the users at the Blue Brain. And we are a small team of uh, six SREs. So a little bit about our organization, the Blue Brain Project. The ultimate goal is to digitally reconstruct and simulate the mouse brain and also pioneer simulation neuroscience. And uh, we hope that it will better help the understanding of the human brain also with some potential applications in health and disease research. And as you see from the organization chart, we are coming from different parts of the organization. So this was done as a, as a collaboration. And about our presentation, so we want to give you some ideas for how to approach an on-premise cluster setup. And these ideas can also be applied to a cloud environment. And it's more intended as giving you some pointers to start. And also some of our slides might take, have a lot of text. So you should also be able to use them as a reference after this talk. And some useful prerequisites, since this is the 101 track, is like basic knowledge about Kubernetes architecture and basic knowledge about some resource type, and some knowledge of Helm, and Helm chart is a plus. But again, if you haven't learned about this yet, you can always come back to our presentation later as a recording. So how did our interest in Kubernetes start? So within my team, we were using OpenShift, which was the organization's container platform. And uh, in the setup that we had, there were some features that were missing, for example, a flexible ingress configuration as Nginx was doing it. And uh, using Helm charts was something that we wanted to do, but at that point, it was not possible. And then we started realizing together with the developers that Kubernetes, vanilla Kubernetes, might be a, a good solution for us from the developer point of view. So we started uh, a bit of prototyping and figuring out how to deploy Kubernetes on OpenStack and started creating an Ubuntu-based uh, Kubernetes cluster for internal testing. And then we did some documenting and of the installation and the deployment process. And then we presented our test results to Daniel's team and started discussing the next steps. And as you can see from the timeline, this internal testing already took a few months but we had a, a prototype and some use cases that we wanted to do that we could hand over to Daniel's team. Okay, so I would like to start my part of the presentation talking about the Blue Brain project infrastructure. And as you can see on the slide, we have three different data centers. First, one in Lugano, where we have our supercomputer. We also have an eight petabytes spectrum scale for scientific data storage and a, TS, and a TSN system for tapes for backup on tapes. We have another one in Lausanne where we have our disaster recovery storage based on NetApp. And finally, we have another one in Geneva where we have our private cloud based on OpenStack. And this is where we run most of our services from, including Kubernetes. Also in Geneva, we have a, a little bit under four petabytes of enterprise storage based on NetApp. And this is the catalog of services that we offer to our users in the organization. So as you can see, we have things like OpenStack, we have Puppet. Puppet is our configuration management tool that we use to configure and install all of our services. We have things like GitLab, Jira, Confluence. We offer several different databases technologies to our users, uh, authentication via Keycloak, 
and all that monitoring stack of tools. And all of this I just mentioned is all virtualized and all on-premises. So with this in mind, let's talk now about the situation we had before Kubernetes. So before Kubernetes, we were running the open source version of OpenShift, so OpenShift Origin 3.11, based on Kubernetes uh, 1.11. And by the release date, you can already tell that it was getting quite old at the end of 2020. Uh, one problem that we had is that the people who work on this deployment had left the team already. And also, it was relying on an Ansible playbook. Uh, this is not a problem per se, but as I mentioned before, we use Puppet for configuring all of our services, and OpenShift was just the exception. Uh, because of the way it was deployed, day-to-day -day operations were tedious and cumbersome. So things like adding new worker nodes or changing the quota of a project required several different steps from the operators, and it was quite error-prone. And finally, it didn't have support for some of the features that our users were starting to request. Things like Helm charts, uh, GitOps, or a more modern ingress. So this is why a change was needed. So at the beginning of 2021, this is when we started this proof of concept based on vanilla Kubernetes. In this case, we went for Kubernetes 120 with container D and run C. And since the beginning of the POC, we had a few things clear. Uh, we wanted to be virtualized, running on our existing private cloud OpenStack. We wanted to use Red Hat Enterprise Linux as the operating system, and of course, with SC Linux enabled and set to enforcing. And we would use Puppet for the installation and initial cluster configuration, so no difference with any of our other services. And also, we would like to use some kind of GitOps approach to automate the configuration of the cluster. As you can see there, there is a little timeline. Uh, it took us around three months to get the first uh, version up and running. And then starting in, in April, this is when we tested it uh, internally for around six months. And then in October, we decided to invite some external users to this uh, proof of concept uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then in December, after some testing, we decided that it was production ready. And after that, this is when we started the decommissioning of OpenShift. So, this is some of the features that we offered back in 2021 with that first uh, Kubernetes uh, production cluster. As you can see, it was based on Kubernetes 121. For the CNI, we went for Calico, support for Ingress Nginx controller, authentication via Keycloak. For the CSI, we went for Trident, since we were using NetApp as the backend. Uh, Kiberno, support for Helm charts, GitLab registry, since we were already using uh, or installing, uh, having a GitLab in-house. In Support for IBM Spectrum Scale, via NFS mounts. Flux, uh, encrypted secrets with uh, Mozilla SOPs, and Cert Manager. So it's uh, the Q3 of uh, 2021, and we had this new uh, Kubernetes cluster uh, up and running, but we were also running uh, the old OpenShift in parallel. So at that time, what we did is we audited everything running on OpenShift, and we contacted the, the responsibles for those deployments. And luckily, a uh, majority of those users, those developers, they managed to migrate their applications by, the, by themselves. And in most of the cases, it was just a matter of exporting the, the resource as a YAML file and then reimporting it back into Kubernetes. Unfortunately for us, there was no way to automatically migrate the, the volumes from OpenShift to Kubernetes, although in both cases we were using the same backend, uh, NetApp in this case, the driver was different, so an automatic migration was not possible. So what users needed to do is basically copy the contents from one volume running in one system into, into the other. And finally, we also needed to migrate the, the container images. Um, and this was an easy migration. Uh, what users needed to do is push the already existing images into the new registry, in this case GitLab. So, about our cluster deployment, uh, as I said, it's 100% on-premises, 100% virtualized, running on OpenStack. For the operating system, uh, we are running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8, although at the beginning we started with 7, and around one year ago we made an operating system upgrade. The current version of Kubernetes we are using in production is 125, so that means we did five upgrades in the last two years. And we tried to run N minus one version of Kubernetes in production, being N the latest stable of Kubernetes. 
currently we have two different clusters, Broad for production and Dev for development. Architecture-wise, they are both the same. Uh, we have three control planes of both of them, where we also run etcd and an amount of worker nodes. Uh, yeah, both clusters, they have the same configuration. This is enforced by, first by Puppet and then by Flux. But of course, in Dev, we have fewer and smaller worker nodes, so we don't waste resources there. Since config-wise, they are both clusters are identical, we encourage our users to run some of their test workloads on our Dev cluster. So every time we change some configuration file or we upgrade the Kubernetes version, they they uh, they realize if they need to change something on their side uh, first there. So about the usage, uh, with this slide you can get a pretty good idea of on how big our production cluster is. As you can see, we have around 500 allocatable cores at the moment, a little bit under one terabyte of allocatable memory, and a little bit over one terabyte of requested storage. It's not here on this slide, but if you're curious, we have around 450 pods. So let's talk now about multi-tenancy, because this was a very important concept for us, because this comes out of the box in OpenShift uh, via OpenShift projects, and we wanted to have something similar in, in Kubernetes. Since we were using Flux to configure our Kubernetes cluster, we based this multi-tenancy configuration on that repo, the Flux 2 multi-tenancy repo, although ended up, we ended up changing it so much that it's basically a different thing, but it, it was a good starting point. And the way it works is each each team in the organization gets their own namespace, and then we define some resource uh, quotas per namespace, so we can limit the, the resources they can use. And then for authorization, there is a role binding, referencing an, an LDAP group, and then each member of this LDAP group gets admin access within that namespace. And when the users log in, the, user, the, the groups the user uh, is member of are passed in the UIDC token as a, as a claim. Another thing we implemented is this isolation between pods. Uh, so by default, we have a very restrictive uh, network policy that basically blocks all ingress and egress traffic. And we wanted to have it like this. So our developers, they need to make a conscious decision if they want to open access from and to their pods. And finally, we offer optional Flux integration for those teams that they would like to start using Flux. Let's talk now about the installation. So as I mentioned before, uh, we did it with Puppet. So for this, we use the Kubernetes Puppet module developed by Puppet Labs. And if you're familiar with Puppet, this is not the typical Puppet module. It comes alongside with a container image that basically generates the certificates and some of the HERA configuration that then Puppet will apply. And yeah, the, this tool is kubectool. And you need to keep this in mind in case you want to reinstall the cluster in the future, because this certificates, the etcd and the Kubernetes certificates, are generated before the installation with the IPs and host names that you specify. So if you want to reinstall the cluster, uh, you may need to also regenerate the, the certificates. But as you can see, the, the usage is quite simple. You just need to specify some uh, variables, uh, things like the operating system you would like to install Kubernetes on, in our case, Red Hat, the version of Kubernetes, and the container runtime, in our case, ContainerD, the, your CNI of choice, in our case, Calico with the Tiger operator and its version, and things like the etcd initial cluster, etcd IP, and the advertise address. You run this command, and it generates these four YAML files. It's one per control plane node and one common one. The common one, this Red Hat YAML, is basically what we specified before. As you can see, it's this Hera uh, variables format, and it's the values we specified before. And this file is truncated. But as you can see, it also generates the, the certificates and it stores them, it stores them as, uh, as uh, variables. And just to finish with the installation part, uh, here is divided in two different parts. So the, the, there is one first part done by Puppet, and then there is a second part done by Flux with the, help, with the help of Helm. So the first part done by Puppet is also divided in two parts. The first four steps are done by the module. So the module makes sure that the certificates are created on the nodes, it bootstraps an initial etcd cluster and installs Kubernetes. In this case, it uses uh, kubeadm under the hood, and it does the init and join depending if it's a worker node or a control plane. And finally, installs and configures your CNI of choice, as, uh, as I said, in our case, Calico. And then we wrote some custom Puppet code that basically uh, does the flux bootstrapping, 
and enables uh, OIDC authentication. So up to this point, this is where you have a minimum working Kubernetes cluster. And this is when Flux picks up and starts installing and configuring things like Kiberno plus all the cluster policies, Cert Manager, Trident, uh, Kubernetes dashboard, et cetera, et cetera. So how is it running uh, Kubernetes clustering in production? So I must say that for us, the operators, the overhead is quite minimum. Uh, nowadays, things like water changes are all managed with Flux. So for us, it's just a matter of changing a, a file and then pushing the changes, and then Flux uh, will take care of the rest. Adding new worker nodes, as simple as creating a new VM, put the VM in the right host group, and then Puppet runs, and that VM uh, will be a um, new worker node, part of the cluster in a matter of minutes. For cluster upgrades, we do them in place. So that means that we upgrade every single element of the, of the cluster. And we do this, of course, with Puppet and some helper scripts that we wrote. And it's as simple as changing uh, one of those uh, values in that uh, file that I showed you before, pushing the changes, then Puppet runs, and things like kubeadm, kubectl, and kubelet, they get upgraded. It's just slightly different if you're upgrading a control plane node or a worker node. For control planes, we also need to run uh, that command. So we use kubeadm upgrade command. And for the worker nodes, uh, we use one of those scripts that I mentioned before to drain the node first. So we make sure there are no pods running there. Then we run Puppet, so the upgrade actually happens. And then we, when everything is, is fine, we encode on the node. So um, how is my team migration into Kubernetes and, and the future plans we have for the, for the cluster? So it's true that we have this cluster and we offer it to the organization. But we run most of our services still nowadays in, in VMs on OpenStack. But these are just some of the examples of, of applications that we are already running in, in Kubernetes. So we have things like the GitLab runners. We have some dummy applications to verify the cluster status, some Slack bots, uh, open search, and various Prometheus exporters. And for the future plans we would like to have is uh, we'd like to have some kind of cluster autoscaler. So ideally, VMs on OpenStack will be deleted or created depending on the cluster node. And we would like to have service mesh probably with Linkerd. Uh, we're interested in having an MTLS in between pods. So the overall experience is very good. We are very, very happy with Kubernetes. It's true that at the beginning, you need to get used to looking at huge YAML files and some of the flag score concepts. Uh, but it's definitely worth it. Uh, one of the fears we used to have before moving into Kubernetes is that our users would miss the fantastic OpenShift web UI. But in the end, it was not the case. And our developers, they are happy interacting with the cluster via kubectl, lens, k9s, or even the Kubernetes dashboard. And if you're in a similar situation, we were a couple of years ago, and you're thinking into bringing Kubernetes into your organization, uh, one thing that helped us a lot or help our users a lot is to write some uh, easy to follow how to guides with things that your users would need to do on a day to day basis. Things like how to connect to the cluster, or how to use the Kubernetes dashboard, or a quick start with Flex. And uh, I will continue the presentation with the user's point of view. So, as I mentioned before, I work in the team developing BlueBrain Nexus, which is the main data management platform for BlueBrain project to organize all of the neuroscience data. And it has a backend for knowledge graph management and then a web interface for a more user-friendly access for the scientists. And it's fully deployed in Kubernetes. And there is a link to the application if you're interested in learning more about it. So the BlueBrain Nexus infrastructure consists of several different components. There is the Delta backend and Fusion frontend. And then there is the storage part and other backend components like Elasticsearch, Blaze Graph as the knowledge graph and PostgreSQL for data storage and then Geekloak with its own PostgreSQL instance. And we collect metrics with uh, Prometheus and then visualize them with Grafana and also visualize some of them with Kibana. And then we use Alert Manager for, for alerting and uh, sending alerts to Slack. And all of this is deployed in Kubernetes. So before, in our old setup, when we had to make a change, we first had to use the OC apply F command to apply the change to our OpenShift cluster. And uh, then there was the second step, the manual, to commit your changes to Git. So this was a quite error-prone process that we wanted to improve because somebody could change something in the cluster, 
forget or not have time to commit it to Git. So we, this is something we wanted to improve. And now we're still storing our configuration in Git, but we're using Flux for a more GitOps approach. So it will pick up the changes and then apply them in the Kubernetes cluster for us. And some other new use cases that are now possible in the new Kubernetes setup is to have Git as an actual source of truth and then use Flux as for the automation part. And we can also start using Helm charts and some flexible ingress configurations with Nginx. And we're using Mozilla subs to encrypt secrets and store them in Git. And for the daily operations, again, from a user point of view, so that we have two different Kubernetes cluster in the organization. There is the dev cluster and then there is the production cluster. So in the dev cluster, we have a replica of our dev environment where we can destroy it completely, delete backups and see what happens or test some, some other new features or test Kubernetes upgrades and how they influence us. And then there is the Kubernetes production cluster, which is more rainbows and unicorns. So it has a dev staging and production environment, but it's meant more for the software developers to test their new features in dev, and then for external users to test the features in staging, and production is for production. And as uh, an example, if you want to move into Kubernetes, what you would need to do to port your applications to Kubernetes. So first you would need to decide how you want to deploy your application. Some alternatives are to find a Helm chart or create a Helm chart if nobody has done it yet. Or you just uh, create the necessary Kubernetes manifest, like if you just need a deployment and a service and ingress configuration if you have something very simple to, to deploy. And uh, then you need to go through the steps of configuring and testing the Helm charts or the Kubernetes manifest. So you deploy them in your dev cluster or dev environment and then keep resolving any errors that might appear. Because uh, if you take a Helm chart, uh, it might not work uh, like right away and the Helm chart quality also varies between one Helm chart to another. So you just need to test that it works for exactly what you want to do. And of course, in store that, ensure that the storage and the network configuration works and add some test data in your application. And uh, finally, you can apply your working configuration to some other environments. If you store your manifest and charts in Git, it makes it easier. And then you can use Helm chart and Flux to, to scale your applications to, to other environments. And the migration process for a user if you're migrating into Kubernetes from somewhere else. So first you need to learn about Kubernetes and it can be quite a lot to take in, but don't worry, it's doable. So you can learn about Kubernetes and the overall architecture and then some resource type, for example, role-based access control and network policies. And then you go into the testing and development phase, which is more what I was presenting in the previous slide. So finding or creating a Helm chart or the manifest to deploy your application, and then actually deploying and testing your application, and then deciding also how to use your available namespaces and Kubernetes cluster, depending on how your organization is setting, setting up Kubernetes and using it. And then you need to plan and test and execute the data migration. So you do a backup and then migrate the existing data to a new environment. And depending on how your application is set up, it may require some downtime or not. And of course, keep a backup of the old data in case it's needed at some point after. And then finally, you switch to the new environment at some point. So you verify that your application is working with the new data. Everything can connect properly, notify users, and then finally start routing traffic to your new deployment. So some things to keep in mind throughout the migration process. So quite a lot of time was spent on prototyping and testing. And also a Kubernetes version has about one year of support. So make sure that you also test operating Kubernetes and uh, include that as, as part of, of your process. And also consider and test existing use cases. So talk to the user. So this is something we, we did a lot. My team with the developers talking to Daniel's team core services who are the operators and making sure that everything works. And then allocate some time to train your teams and ensure that it's easy to use uh, rollback changes if needed. So if you use something like GitOps, you can just revert the commit if you committed something that was wrong. And also something like network policies and role-based access control and the ingress configuration might need some adjustment. You can have pods that can't connect to each other. So it's good to understand how, how this component works in Kubernetes. And I link to the documentation here if you want to read more about it. And also be aware of internal networks in a company. If you have a company proxy, you may need to set this HTTP proxy or HTTPS proxy or the lowercase version, this environment variable, 
in your virtual machines or where you're running Kubernetes, and maybe also in your applications or Helm charts. So this depends. But if you have a strange connection issue, like you're not able to like clone a Git repository to your pod, for example, then this might be something to look into. And Helm chart quality varies a lot. So again, it's, it's a matter of really testing and trying it out and see if it works for you. And of course, set up monitoring and alerting and dashboard to keep an eye on, on your applications to make sure they work. So as a summary, start prototyping as soon as possible because that's the only way you can start figuring out what problems you will hit and how to fix them and set up a collaboration between the users and operations team so that you can understand what use cases you have and uh, how to solve them. And also evaluate the decisions against the needs of your team and organization because Kubernetes has a quite big ecosystem. So you may start to make a lot of choices up front, like Kubernetes clusters or namespaces for the users, or what container network interface should you have, or what permissions do the users have in the cluster. And usually a good thing is to use a standard alternative, unless you have a reason not to. For example, if you want a specific feature from your networking plugging, or if you do some benchmarking, that's a, that's a good reason to not use a standard alternative. And ask for help in the Kubernetes and CNCF Slack instances, because there is thousands of people there who are happy to help you with any question and benefit from all the automation possibilities that uh, the Kubernetes ecosystem is offering. And finally, become a Kubernetes and present what you did at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. So yeah, that's it for us. If you're interested in this, we're actually hiring. And if you have any questions, come talk to us. Thank you.